Rafael Nadal's campaign for an 11th French Open title is still on track, but only just. I'm here to preview the men's semi-finals at Roland Garros. <laughs> Hey guys, welcome back to the tennis vlog. As always, don't forget to subscribe if you haven't done so already. So, the 2018 men's semi-finals lineup at Roland Garros is completed a day late, but it's still done. So starting with the semi-final featuring a more unusual name, we have number 7 seed Dominic Thiem, who is in his third straight French Open semi-final against world number 72, Marco Cecchinato. In their most recent matches, Thiem came past number 3 seed Alexander Zverev in straight sets, and Cecchinato unleashed a shock upset to take down Novak Djokovic in four sets. Before we take a deeper look at those matches, I'm going to briefly round up how both players got to this stage of the event. Given his occasional nickname Prince of Clay, Dominic Team has struggled a bit more than expected getting to this round. We can see that he opened with a smooth victory, but that preceded three straight four-set matches. Of course, there were difficult opponents there in rising star Stefanos Tsitsipas and Japan's Kei Nishikori, who could have made so much more impact on the tour has he not been so consistently injured. Still, team remains here and his quarterfinal victory over Zverev was particularly dominant. Despite the fact that team is looking good at the moment, his win over Zverev was not purely down to his brilliance. Zverev was injured during that match, it was more evident towards the end of the second set and throughout the third set and that did hamper him a bit. He was struggling to move, I think it was a hamstring injury. Couldn't get to the place on the court where he wanted to be and that allowed team to pinpoint that and move him around and just make him generally feel more uncomfortable than he already was which sounds harsh, but it's tennis, it's a harsh sport. What we can say about that quarterfinal match is Team was ultra-focused and he just looked completely at home on this stage at this particular round of the tournament and looked very ready for what was to come next. We know that on his day he has a game made for Clay. he can be very consistent and turn defence into attack, his one-handed backhand particularly can be lethal and he can attack with that very well. Against Zverev he was mixing it up, playing smartly, they are two players that know each other very well, have faced off multiple times already on on fairly high profile stages, they played at the French Open before, and despite Team having the better clay court record, Zverev was coming off final appearances in both Madrid and Rome, one of them he won, and he beat Team in Rome. So it was a very composed and collected performance from Team. even though he could see that his opponent was struggling, he did not let that put him off his game, he continued attacking and doing what he needed to do to finish off the match. Much more to be said about Kecinato's quarter final win, and we'll go across to look at his run, his amazing run to a maiden Grand Slam quarter-final after winning his first ever Grand Slam match at this event. That first ever Grand Slam win came in five sets in the first round over Marius Kopil and it came 10-8 in the fifth set. So close to bowing out in the first round of the tournament, but Kecinato displayed mental strength there. In rounds three and four he beat top 10 seeded opposition and then in the quarter-finals he got a more high-profile win than them over 2016 champion Novak Djokovic. Now I don't want to say that I predicted Kecinato to win that match because I didn't. I did not have the nerve or the bravery to predict that to happen, but there were parts of me that thought he could give Djokovic some trouble. A, because Djokovic has been struggling for form of late, he's been up and down, he's been making small improvements but then suffering brutal losses, and this is another one of them. But also Kecinato has been on the rise on clay for two or three years now. He's had most of his experience on clay, the vast majority of his titles and his finals have come on the surface. He's grown up playing on it, he's very comfortable on it, it, and he recently won his first ATP title on it a matter of weeks ago in Budapest. Interestingly, Kecinato and Djokovic have been regular practice partners for each other, and when I found out about that, I was inclined to think that would be more of a help for Djokovic because he knew the game style of his opponent. This is a stage that obviously Djokovic is very much familiar with. Kecinato, first time, how was he going to handle that mentally? It was more likely that he was going to not be able to handle the enormity of the situation. That didn't turn out to be true. Because Djokovic Djokovic did have upper body tightness in the first couple of sets and people were wondering about an injury, I don't think Kecinato was given enough credit for how incredibly he played in the opening two sets. He was attacking from the offset, his one-handed backhand was giving Djokovic a load of trouble, and Djokovic has had a lot of trouble with one-handed backhands at the French Open and on clay in recent years. He was getting deep into the courts with it, targeting the corners, wrong-footing Djokovic, but he was also doing things like landing incredible drop shots, especially into the ad court, executing them perfectly 
and making Djokovic run all over the court. His consistency on the defense was brilliant and he was able to use his slice and his placement to turn the point around, to draw Djokovic forwards and pass him, all that kind of thing. But despite how well he played, in the end it was a match that Djokovic let slip through his fingers. Kecinato was there ready and waiting to take hold of the opportunity but it was on Djokovic's racket in the end and he let it go and that's what Djokovic has really been struggling with recently, closing out matches, finishing them off, being there in the key pressure moments and that's what he used to be so great at. After the first two sets and saving three set points to win that second set in his high break, Kecinato was obviously on a high and then that fizzled out and a lot of his adrenaline was gone, he didn't seem as focused on the match and Djokovic was totally capitalizing on that, he rolled through the third set as Kecinato looked flatter and more erratic and he looked ready to serve out the fourth set as well but that is when he started making errors. Kecinato sensed that, he just took hold of the moment, started striking deep again, summoned back the magic of earlier in the match because it is tough, part of what makes five sets tough is sustaining your intensity all the way through the match. After winning the first two sets, especially after coming so close to losing the second, the intensity and the urgency was gone and Kecinato struggled to sustain that level but when Djokovic opened the door again the adrenaline just came back and it was tangible really. That fourth set tiebreak was incredible, the mix of shots, the lobs, the drop shots, the passes, but there were also key misses from Djokovic. He had a drive volley on his forehand to win the set on set point and he shanked it and that's something that you rarely see from Djokovic, especially not at such a key moment. So Kecinato played incredible nerveless stuff to win that match but Djokovic did let it slip a bit at the end in my opinion. It's interesting because while I thought that Djokovic knowing his opponent would relax him for this situation I think it worked the other way around because this was a brand new atmosphere and occasion for Kecinato but he was playing against a player whose game style he knew, who he knew as a person and that seemed to help him just kind of engage and settle down into the situation. That won't be the case with Dominic Team because while the two of them have faced off before it's a different scenario a different type of player, two one-handed backhanders facing off and this one should be interesting because while Team is the far more the experienced of the two players he is yet to reach a Grand Slam final himself and all the pressure is essentially on him because he is the one with the expectation. If Kecinato could handle his match against Djokovic so well mentally there is no reason why he couldn't do so again, he doesn't seem to be tired after all the long matches that he's been playing, but Team looks so sure of himself at the moment he probably didn't have as good a clay court season prior to this as he was hoping for given his success last season but he's kept his head down, he's worked hard, that backhand is finding its mark, he knows how to be present in the key moments of matches. It's just about how he himself deals with the situation. He has never been in a major semi-final where he is the heavy favourite to come through. He's played an informed Novak Djokovic and an informed Rafael Nadal in his previous two semi-finals here so very different situations. Despite the fact that Kecinato's game is a brilliant fit for clay courts, I was ready to predict team to win this match and then I looked at the head-to-head -head, and even though it was a futures event, Kecinato has won their only previous meeting on clay. That came five years ago in 2013 and that was in straight sets and in their only meeting since in Doha, team needed three sets to come through that one, losing the first 6-1. Team has come a long way in the past four years and he has steadily built up his career even though he has yet to reach a Grand Slam final, it's been a steady progression for him, but Kecinato is in the zone and and given his talent and ability there is no telling what he could do. We could legitimately be seeing the world number 72 in a Grand Slam final but based on experience and the fact that he looks ready to handle this occasion I'm going to give Dominic Team the benefit of the doubt. I'm going to predict Team in either four or five sets and even though I think a fifth set might revitalize Kecinato I think that these two are going to push each other close and I'm going to say Dominic Team to win this match in five sets. So moving on to the more high profile clash of Rafael Nadal, the top seed and defending champion against Juan Martin Del Potro, the number five seed. Starting with Del Potro simply because I have a lot more to say about Nadal. Del Potro isn't the first name that comes to mind when you think of players who could be successful on clay but throughout the period where the likes of Novak Djokovic, Andy Murray, Stan Wawrinka have been struggling with injury, Del Potro has been one of the players back from injury himself to rise up and take advantage and he's been doing that now across all 
all surfaces. Notable victories in all four of his first matches against Nicola Mahu, Julian Benetau, Albert Ramos Vinolas, and John Isner. The second two particularly impressive given that he got them in straight sets against players who, one of them very good on clay, and the other one in the best form potentially of his life right now. Throughout those early rounds, Del Potro's ability to problem solve and work his way smartly through matches shone through. But in his quarterfinal against Marin Cilic, it was more of a case of surviving at times. In a way, two pretty similar players there in Cilic and Del Potro, both of them with big serves, big forehands, like playing from the baseline, can come to the net if need be. It was always going to come down to a handful of points, and the further into the match they went, those handful of points were going the way of Del Potro. Both of them had to deal with rain delays in the first sets, which perhaps jolted Cilic's rhythm a bit because he was ahead in the first set tiebreak, but Del Potro showed a greater mental stability on the day to edge this one out. Cilic was throwing in a lot of unforced errors, and it could be an issue for Del Potro that he wasn't capitalizing on them enough. Given the amount of errors that Cilic was making, he was pushed potentially closer than he should have been. But the fact is that Del Potro hung tough, went for his shots, and got them in the right moments in order to come through, and he now has time to reflect and rest up ahead of a big match against Nadal. And given the way Nadal progressed to the semi-final stage, he might fancy his chances a bit more against the Spaniard than he originally would have done. It's very easy when you see Nadal on clay winning every match without dropping a set to say that he is rolling through the tournament, but actually I would say that last year at the French Open, Nadal's physical domination was the most impressive thing, the way he just got on top of the ball every time and pummeled his opponents. This year, what has been more impressive has been his mental strength, the way that he has taken a deep breath and thought his way through matches, worked his way through when he's been on the back foot, and especially against Diego Schwartzman in the quarterfinals. Before we get to that one, he did come through his first four rounds without dropping a set. Simone Bellelli gave him a bit of a scare in his opening round, pushing him close in the first set and the final set particularly, moving him around the court, but Nadal came through in straights all the same, as previously mentioned. He did look pretty dominant against Guido Pea in the second round, and then against Richard Gasquet, who he has never lost a completed match to on the Pro Tour. Signs that he was not at his physical best came against Maximilian Martyrer, the 22-year-old German, in the fourth round, because Martyrer was able to dictate him around the court a bit, crack down on his shots, give him a bit of trouble, and Diego Schwartzman was the one to expose that Nadal is not truly at his peak level, or wasn't before their match, he may be now. Schwartzman had been brilliant in coming from two sets to love down to beat Kevin Anderson over a foot taller than him, sorry to bring up his height again, in the fourth round, and he had shown great resilience, great intensity, great belief to do that. Anybody who watched that match should have been expecting him to produce more of the same against Nadal, because once you have faced a player that tall, playing that well with that much precision in the early stages and come past them in five sets, intimidation begins to fade. Schwartzman was especially cracking down with the forehand. He was firing some really explosive forehands and going for his shots off the sidelines into the corners. However, this might not have been possible without two things. A, the fact that Nadal really was not playing great tennis at all, was struggling to find his first serve, was making unusual errors in nearly every game, including missed smashes. And B, the fact this, it was a very heavy atmosphere, that it was either raining or threatening to rain for the majority of the first one and a half sets, which is when Schwartzman was almost dominating the match. In a way, it was close, but he was clear-cut the best player on the court at that point in time. Nadal hates those wet and heavy conditions, because Schwartzman was hitting quite a heavy ball anyway, but when the ball is wet and when the atmosphere is heavy, he can't get as much topspin on his ball, which is what makes him so lethal on the surface when the ball is going deep and flying high. He's He's just generally always found it really difficult against that heavy shot, and that was evident against Schwartzman. And having that low first serve percentage was really just killing him because Schwartzman was not holding back. And once again, at least partway through that second set and during the third set, it was Nadal's mental strength and his ability to problem solve during a match with great, smart play. That was what got Nadal through that match. Nadal was a set and a breakdown when they had to call off play for the day due to rain, and twice before when he had been called off for a rain delay this clay court season, Nadal had against Zverev come back to win every game for the rest of the match to take the victory, and against Simone Bellelli he had won at least most of the games, if not all of the games, to win that particular set. I've seen a lot of people suggesting that Nadal got through this match due to luck or that it was unfair. It merely demonstrates the incredible mental ability of Nadal and his ability to 
use that to his advantage to regroup, to refocus, to assess what he's doing wrong and go out and change that. But it also shows that however well Schwartzman was playing, that atmosphere has an impact on Nadal's game. Long story short, when they came back out, Schwartzman was not as accurate and Nadal was cracking down on that ball, getting the depth back, not afraid to go for his forehand, which he had been tentative with before. And while there were some long marathon games in the rest of that clash, it was Nadal who came out on top in them. He was using the slice, using the drop shot, mixing things up just pulling every shot out of the bag, especially in the key moments he was pulling off some brilliant tennis. And while at the beginning of that match, Nadal looked on very dangerous ground and very shaky, by the end of it, he seemed to have his physical ability back alongside his mental composure. That is not great news for Del Potro, even though he has five previous wins over Nadal and has a game that's really caused Nadal trouble due to his heavy hitting, his big serve. The forecast hasn't been great for the rest of the event, so that Del Potro can be hoping for more of the same weather conditions, because whether he he likes it or not himself is definitely an issue for Nadal. Looking at their head-to-head -head is really interesting because you can see that even in the nine matches which Nadal has won he has often been pushed by Del Potro. Although he got his first five wins over him in straight sets his last four wins over him have all been stretched beyond straight sets. The most recent of these was on the way to his US Open title last year that was also in the semi-finals and Nadal rebounded from losing the first set to win in four. As far as clay court matches go they have faced off on clay twice. Nadal has won both of those encounters, but the most recent one, which was in 2011, was a four-set clash, and Nadal won that fourth set in a tiebreak. They have also faced off at the French Open before, a match that Nadal won in straight sets, but that was all the way back in 2007, so over a decade ago now, and Del Potro has come a long way since then. I think the opportunity of facing Nadal and the big stage will make Del Potro up his game, and even if he's feeling fatigue, he's going to leave it all out there. He looked done and dusted against Dominic Team at the US Open last year and he looked really tired. People were writing him off and he rose back up and came through that one. So I don't think physical tiredness is a reason to write Del Potro out of this one. However, it is clay. And it's a more exhausting surface. You have to work the points harder. And at the end of the day, Nadal is just a much better clay court player than Del Potro. However, he is not always facing the power and the heaviness of shot that will come from Del Potro's rackets. It's a bit of a tricky one, especially when we don't know what the weather is going to be like and I think that that could have an impact. Given that Del Potro is in decent form it's probably a bit risky to predict this one to end in straight sets but at the end of his clash with Schwartzman Nadal had really tightened the screws, was very comfortable playing in all positions on the court. Team was in great form in the semi-finals last year and Nadal absolutely hammered him. I am going to predict Rafael Nadal to win this next match in straight sets. Okay that's it for this one. Thank you for watching and do let me know who you think will make the final and which final you would particularly like to see. Please don't forget to subscribe to the channel if you haven't. Thank you for watching and I'll see you at the next video.